Howdy y'all, it's Curious Raven. It is Creepy Pasta Saturday today. We are doing a story by CIA Herpes, and it is called The CIA Created a New MK Ultra Program. It has yielded fantastic results. I've worked for the CIA for the last 20 years. My jobs vary, ranging from torture to weapons smuggling to chemical weapons manufacturing. When an insurgency begins in a hostile country like Syria or Libya, my job sometimes requires me to traffic in guns, ammo, and money. So I had seen a lot of things. I felt a sense of relief when I was told that from now on, I would only have to work within the United States. When my superior, Agent White, called me to his office one hot summer morning last year, I went right away. Sit down, Agent Black, he said to me, motioning to the chair across the desk. Do you want coffee or anything? Sure, I said, and he called his secretary to bring us both coffees. She hustled in, dropping the steaming hot cups in front of us and leaving immediately without a word. So, he said, We've been hearing a lot of chatter lately about the Chinese starting a mind control program. I nearly choked on my coffee when he said that. That stuff is all bullshit, sir, I said dryly. You know it is. You know it and I know it. The CIA tried that in the 60s and they had no results. MK Ultra, MK Often, and Chickwit already covered that ground unsuccessfully, I might add. He smiled slightly at this. They had no results that they publicized, you mean, he said. The truth is slightly more nuanced. MKUltra was not run with the kind of scientific vigor that we would bring to a modern experiment. However, they were basically just doing dosing people with huge doses of LSD or injecting them with anhyphamines and barbiturants until they became drooling idiots. That is not the experience we are interested in funding. So what is it, I asked, genuinely curious. We want to see whether certain people can see the future, keeping them under control, scientific confinement, in the process to rule out any kind of fraud or charlatanism. Also, we want to see if psychics can see military secrets in the presence, secrets that we don't currently have access to. Any advances in interrogation techniques archived from the use of new drugs would also be funded. We are particularly interested in the potential of Bromo Dragonfly and Alpha PVP in test subjects. Both have caused nightmarish hallucinations in people accompanied by visions of hell, which could be useful for getting hardened subjects to talk. He paused for a long moment after this, looking thoughtful. In psychic research, of course, he scoffed. Psychics, I said scornfully. Like from a circus? Are we bringing in tarot card readers too? He laughed. Sir, why not, he said, handing me a slip of paper. Report here tomorrow morning. It will be your first day with the researchers. We decided to call it Operation Raven. I went to the address, written in Agent White's tiny copper plate handwriting. By the time I pulled up to the front gate, the sun had just started to rise. I had always liked getting an early start. Two armed guards sat at a booth, a red and white striped metal gate blocking the way inside. Behind them, I saw a massive round buildings with no windows. The buildings stood tall and imposing, forming perfect cubes of small concrete surrounded by row after row of razor wire. Identification, a guard said, coming up to the window and putting out his left hand. He kept the other near his holstered pistol. I opened my wallet and flashed my CIA credentials. After staring at it for a long moment, he nodded, going back to the booth, allowing the thick metal gates to slide open. I had never been here before, and I was amazed how many cars filled the parking lot. Hundreds of them stretched out in front of my eyes. And I drove around for five minutes before finding an empty spot towards the back. As I started the trek towards the door, I felt like eyes were watching me from all directions. I signed in again at the front desk of the complex. An armed security guard eyeing me mistrustfully as I pulled out my identification and badge. When I told him who I was and what I was doing there, 
he said to take the elevator to the bottom floor, then pretended to go back to reading his newspaper. Behind the rustling edges, though, I caught him glimpsing everyone who walked past with a soldierly intensity, ready to react at a moment's notice. I go in, seeing the building went all the way from negative five to five. I press the button to negative five, feeling the elevator quickly descending, my stomach rising with the motion. When it drenched and the doors rolled open, I found myself standing in front of a large laboratory. A team of doctors, scientists, and lab workers stood 20 feet away, forming a semicircle around the steaming hot coffee pot in the corner. They discussed something in hushed tones, and when they saw me approaching, they all went silent. Hello, I said calmly, stepping forward. I am Agent Philip Black. The director sent me here to look at your work. The female doctor stepped forward. Even though I towered over her five-foot frame, she exhibited a kind of self-confidence that made her seem larger. Her black hair framed her thin face, and her eyes gleamed with intelligence. She smiled, showing straight white teeth. Her stylish glasses reflected the bright fluorescent lights overhead. Nice to finally put a face with a fake name, she said, grinning. My name is Dr. Lander. I didn't react, simply looking around at the chemistry, equipment, and computers set up. Where do we keep the subjects, I asked. She nodded at a narrow hallway far end of the large laboratory. I'd like to see them. You can see them all you want. Dr. Lander responded. But we're about to start an experiment. Perhaps it would be better if you saw our research firsthand before talking to the subjects. Things will make more sense, I think, if you watch. Sure, I said tearing my gaze away from the narrow hallway. Seemed to beckon me, cool and dark in the corner. I suddenly felt very hot and the lights seemed too bright overhead. Dr. Lander turned and headed towards a room in the corner. I saw a chair welded to the floor with straps, hanging down from both sides. A bag of saline and a syringe filled with blue fluid stood on a metal tray next to the box of latex gloves. Two lab assistants stood at attention, one on each side of the chair. Dr. Lander chatted with one as we waited for the guards to bring the man in. This stuff, Alpha PVP, they call it Flocka on the streets, she said to the assistant. In some subjects, it has called visions of demons, hellfire. We think this is the same stuff that caused someone to eat another guy's face with his bare teeth. We could also use a metaphen psychosis and weakening the subject's will for interrogations. The problem is they start to get delusional. When their information, I stopped listening. His two black suited officers brought in a very hairy man. He was stout, barrel chested, and only about five foot six. But his arms and legs looked like tree trunks covered in thick black hair. He had a unibrow and his eyes looked nearly black. A massive wizard beard hung down to his belly button. He wore a bright orange prison jumpsuit. This is kidnapping, he said in a thick Eastern European accent. You cannot just come and tie people up and take them out of their homes. Dr. Lander ignored his outburst and instead turning to me and the assistants. And as the guard strapped the man down to the chair, she raised the syringe filled with blue liquid so we could all see it. Now, this here is a special combination of drugs we thought might be a good starting point. It is a combination of potent hallucinogens, including LSD-25, ALD-52, Bromo Dragonfly, and more potent purified isomer of alpha PVP. We will be feeding the substance intravenously to the subject during interrogation observing his reaction. Are there any questions? Fuck you, American pig, the man in the chair said. The doctor ignored him. That's not a question, I said, trying to break the tension. No one laughed. Okay, so let's start running the solution then. For the recording, the subject is 102202 Vladimir Grieka. She nodded at the lab assistants who stood next to the IV line, feeding into the man's arm. Go ahead, the lab assistant, a thin man with large glasses and a bonding hairline, 
clipped a syringe, and gingerly screwed it into the plastic tubing taped to the man's arm. The blue fluid mixed with the clear saline as it fed into the man's veins. The dark color lightning as it went in. The subject, Vladimir, continued to hiss and scream at the doctor and her assistants. His eyes met mine, and I noticed they looked rather strange. When I first saw him, I remember thinking about how dark his eyes looked. But now his irises had turned a muddy yellow, like a tiger's eye gemstone. His skull had turned into a grin, and his teeth appeared to sharpen and lengthen. They looked dark and stained with the serrated points covered in a thick yellow film. Where were you during the massacre of your family on April 10th, 2022? Dr. Lander asked Vladimir. His muscles seemed to grow before my eyes ripping through his clothes. He gnashed his teeth as foamy saliva dripping from his mouth. She sighed. Okay, prepare round two of the drug combination on my... I was with my family, of course, you stupid bitch, Vladimir said, his voice deepening and turning into a growl. The black hair on his body looked like it had grown, and even his hands and face were now covered. I had changed. I was hungry. So hungry. They tried running through the forest, but I could see far better in the darkness than they could. I took them one by one, ripping them apart as they screamed and begged for mercy. That was my own wife and three daughters. He leaned forwards in the chair, and as claws sprouted from his fingernails, as white as ivory and as sharp as scalpels. So... What do you think I'll do to you when I get out of this goddamn chair? With a roar, the beast in the chair pulled against the straps. For a few moments, it looked like they would hold. And then, with a ripping noise, they all gave away at once. The man had fully transformed into a wolfish abomination, and silver streams of saliva ran from his grinning mouth. Code silver, code silver, Dr. Lander screamed as she began to run towards the door. Then male lab assistant stood there, quivering and trembling, a bald spot on his head turning a bright red. The other assistant, a young blonde woman, sprinted past me and stood there shocked for a moment, not knowing what to do. But my instinct screamed at me to stay with Dr. Lander without waiting to see what would happen. I turned and started sprinting for the door. Shut the door, shut the door, Dr. Lander cried as the three of us ran out of the room. I looked at the heavy steel door in its shatterproof glass window. What about your assistant? I said. She shook her head. It's too late. He's already dead. Close the door before it gets out. She shoved me aside as her and the blonde assistant grabbed an edge. With a groan, they slammed it closed. Dr. Lander bent over double, hyperventilating. He looked up at her assistant. The job case, he quick thinking. I looked in the window pane and saw the male assistant running towards the door, covered in blood. He definitely was not already dead. I gave Dr. Lander a skewed, mistrustful look. Let me out, please, the assistant pleaded as he slammed his body, his bloody fist, against the small window. His glowing yellow eyes and greasy black fur covering every inch of his body, Vladimir looked like something straight out of a medieval textbook of occultism. He leapt high into the air and came down on the assistant's back, clawing and gnashing his teeth as shreds of fabric and drops of blood flew everywhere. Dr. Lander stared into the room, her eyes as emotionless as that of a marble statue. The blonde assistant shifted nervously from foot to foot, her face flickering from Dr. Lander to the window and back again. Aren't we going to help, Casey? the blonde assistant said. A moment later, the wall shook as the werewolf slammed into the male assistant again, knocking him to the floor. I saw the assistant smear his own blood all across the white walls as he tried to crawl away from the beast, holding one side of his neck with his left hand. Bright red blood spurted between his fingers and soaked his lab coat. The beast jumped and flew across the room. The assistant twisted his body so that he was laying on his back, putting his arms out in a defensive posture. In a blur, the werewolf landed back on top of the prone man, began clawing at his chest and face as the assistant to put his hands up and shield his eyes. I saw his claw slice through 
His fingers like a sharp knife through hot butter. Four digits fell to the side. The man's spurting hand still raised high in the air as he lay on the ground. I heard his gurgling breaths as he began choking on his own blood. I heard Casey gasp and suppress a cry of horror as she watched the final moments of the brutal act. In a show of mercy, the beast knelt down and placed his ivory white teeth over the male assistant's throat. Then he bit deeply into the man's neck and with a sickening spray of blood and ripping sound, finally killed the poor bastard. Well, that was a massive failure, I said spitfully, as we walked away from the gruesome murder scene. Why would you say that, Dr. Lander said politely, her large brown eyes turning to regard me. I mean, your guy is definitely dead. I responded. Is that not a problem? Do you go through assistance like toilet paper here? Sometimes to make an omelet, you have to crack a few eggs, right? Dr. Lander answered, smirking. Casey was sweating heavily and shifting uncomfortably from leg to leg. I think she may have been reassessing her career choice at that moment. That was actually the most information we have gotten out of Vladimir so far. Normally, he just blacks out when the topic of his family is brought up. The hallucinogenic drug mixture is already exceeding expectations. I think we need to try it again on a few more people. But anyways, we have another experiment planned within a few minutes. We'll put in a pin in this one for now. The werewolf continued to shred the dead body in the interrogation room behind us. I heard bones cracking and ripping and squelching sounds. I hope the next one isn't so wet, I inquired. Dr. Lander only gave me a cryptic half-smile. Once the notice for Code Silver got relayed to the ground floor, chaos broke out. A team of men in bulletproof vest and military gear came running out of the elevator, heading in the direction of the interrogation room. I saw they carried special long-barreled tranquilizer guns rather than automatic rifles. What do you use to put down a werewolf, I asked, generally curious. I watched as one soldier flung open the door with a few others stuck their guns in. I heard soft hopping sounds as they fired. Within seconds, they pulled them back out and the door slammed shut again. Oh, it's a special blend we developed here, she said. Normal tranquilizers don't work on them. The super potent opioid like that would take down an elephant just slows them down. So we use a combination of edorphine, herfentolin, and fencyclidin. Even that is sometimes iffy, and it takes a massive dose just to sedate them. They have a very strange neuropharmacology compared to normal animals. For some reason, their highly susceptible synergistic effects from NMDA and agonistus, yet a pure opioid agonist has little effect. Yeah, I really don't know what that means, I said. We came to another cell with a clear plexiglass shield covering the entire front entrance. I peered through wondering what other oddities lay down here in the heart of the Operation Raven. I looked back down the still reinforced halls just in time to see three men in SWAT gear dragging Vladimir's unconscious body along the floor. He had partially returned to his human state. Now he looked more like Neanderthal covered in thick black hair. His strange claws fused to the stubs of his fingers. His face was saturated with coagulated blood. Pieces of gore and shredded skin stuck to the entire front of his now-naked body. Remnants of his orange jumpsuit littered the hall, small pieces of bloody cloth falling to the sides as they pulled him by his arms towards another nearby metal cell with a bulletproof glass front. Okay, our second experiment for the day is a little different. Dr. Lander said as she stepped in front of the, another cell. Looking down the hallway, I saw that each of the rooms on both sides had prisoners. Most were men, but I saw some women and even a few children locked behind the glass walls. I estimated that at least 50 people must live here as subjects in hellish experiments. Dr. Lander pointed at a woman laying on her still bed, but her face turned away from us towards the wall. I saw a few photos on the wall, mostly pictures of small children grinning for the camera in their best clothes. 
Miss Weber? Dr. Lander said politely, her light voice echoing off the cold metal and concrete walls of the building. Can we please talk to you? The woman continued to ignore us. Okay, well, we're coming in. You know the rules. Dr. Lander nodded at Casey, who quickly took a massive ring of keys out of her pocket. With a click, she turned the lock in the ballistic glass front. The glass, clear glass door slid to the side. I looked down the hall and saw a couple armed guards watching us with consternation. They're probably afraid of another code silver, I thought to myself as I entered the cell. This is subject 171041, Mary Vapor. For the recording, Dr. Lander began. Miss Vapor still just stared at her wall, refusing to turn her body. All I could see of her was auburn hair and an orange prison jumpsuit. I wondered if she was dead, or perhaps in a deep catatonic state like some schizophrenics are, experience. What's the point of this? I asked in a low voice to Dr. Lander. Can this woman even talk? Yes, she is physically capable of speech, Dr. Lander said, which didn't seem like an answer to the question. We just have to get her out. What are we testing? I asked. Psychic research, she answered. Miss Faber is capable of seeing events occurring in other parts of the world. Remote viewing, I believe they call it. Her powers extend beyond that. But I'd like to see if I can get any results on smaller details before moving onto larger ones. Dr. Lander turned away from me towards Casey. Okay, let's flip her over. Miss Vapor, we're going to move you so that we can have access to you during the experiment. She nodded at Casey, and with a grunt, they spun Miss Vapor around to face us. When I saw her face, I gasped. Her eyes shone a bright red, without pupil or iris, covered in a film of blood. They looked demonic, vampiric even, yet the blood, that's what it was, didn't overflow. No crimson tears flowed down her face or stained her eyelids. She didn't look old, perhaps in her mid-thirties, in her late thirties. She might have been pretty, with her wavy auburn hair and creamy white skin, yet the bloody demon eyes and blank, statuous expression on her face ruined whatever beauty she possessed. Miss Faber, if you ever want to see your family again, you have to cooperate with us, Dr. Lander said, her tone cold. I thought the use of the word see and poetic under the circumstances. When Miss Weber's face continued to show as much expression as a statue's, Dr. Lander turned to the assistant. Please give the injection. Casey took the needle out of her pocket and had a color, a colorous liquid inside of it. Is this stuff similar to the last experiment? I asked, nervously taking a deep, taking a step back. LAD whatever alpha PC? Casey lifted the plastic tubing taped into one of Miss Vapor's veins and began injecting the drug before pulling out a saline syringe to flush the line. She exhibited a degree of nonchalance that could only characterize as outstanding, especially for someone whose work partner just got murdered by a werewolf a few minutes ago. This stuff is a new experimental substance, Dr. Lander said proudly. We had some results using it on people with latent psychic powers. You won't find it on the streets. What is it? I asked nervously. She paused for a long moment, as if lost in thought. You know what DMT, or um, Threthful Patin, is? It occurs naturally in the brain. And it also causes out-of-body experiences and mystical experiences in most people. Of course I know what DMT is, I said. You know, when the Soviets did their own version of MK Ultra back in the day, they mostly used DMT instead of LSD. Well, this new stuff makes DMT look like ginger beer, she said confidently. The lab used DMT as a starting point. With the tweaks of chemistry, we found something far stronger. She pulled out a clear steel vial and threw it to me with an underhand toss. I read the label carefully. Or Loro HO DMT it read. Experimental drug. Not approved by the FDA or DEA. Not for human consumption. And she tucked it 
into her random lab coat. I looked back over at Miss Vapor and gasped. Translucent white light flowed out from her body, from every pore of her skin and every hair. It circulated over her like water, flowing and reforming. Her mouth formed an O of horror and fear. A silent scream dying in that gaping black hole. Casey stood next to the woman, her eyes wide as she backed up a couple steps. She looked like she wanted to turn and run. I think we've just turned the lights on, Dr. Lynch said. And now it's time to see if anyone's home. She checked her watch and counting down the seconds. After about 30 seconds, she sighed, turning to Casey. Give her another dose, please. Casey seemed to grow paler, but she stood. She took another syringe filled with the clear liquid and began to inject it into the line. By the time she had flushed the last of the substance out of the line with saline, the light swirling around Miss Vapor had became blinding. She suddenly sat up on her thin mattress, her face still formed into a silent scream. Her fingers began to twitch, her arms jerked. Then her face moved into a placid, statuous expression. Her head slowly turned until she was staring directly at me. And with those blood-red, sickly eyes... Whatever you do, don't touch her, a voice said from behind me, sounding like it came from far away. I felt like I was drifting off as I stared into her eyes. I realized I was becoming hypnotized. A hand on my shoulder ripped me back to reality. I spun backing up into the metal wall. And don't stare into her eyes. I looked and saw Casey standing there, a look of empathy of her young face. Miss Faber... I'm going to ask you a few questions, okay? Dr. Lander said in a falsely cheery, cheerful voice. Miss Faber's mannequin-like face turned to stare at Dr. Lander blankly, but Dr. Lander didn't return her stare. What is your full name? I didn't think she would answer. But after a moment, she said, Mary Louise Faber, she whispered in a blank robotic voice. Okay, good, she said, writing something on a clipboard. And do you have knowledge of things happening outside of the cell at this moment? Yes, Ms. Faber said simply. I can see all of it. Give me an example, Dr. Lander pressed. I know you haven't changed your underwear in two days, Ms. Faber said. Does that suffice? Dr. Lander scratched something down on a clipboard. That technically something inside this room, Dr. Lander said, unperturbed. Can you tell me something that's happening in China right now? The leader is discussing three potential Taiwan invasion strategies with his staff, Miss Vapor said. They want the invasion to start by 2025 of the latest. Does that count? Dr. Lander scribbled something frantically, writing out much longer re response on a clipboard than any of the other answers elicited. And Miss Vapor, do you know why you're here? Because... I killed a school full of children, she groaned. It told me 70 of them died. Dr. Lander made a few quick scratches on her notebook. And do you know how you killed them, Dr. Lander asked. The floor vibrated as if an aftershock had passed underneath our feet. I looked at Dr. Lander, but she didn't respond. Miss Faber's face formed into a wide smile. It reminded me of the death mask of a tetanus patient, an insane rictus grin that showed no compassion. Slowly, she said, drawing the word out, like I'm about to do to you. As she finished speaking, the light around her body expanded into a blinding flash. I backed up towards the door instinctively. We saw Casey doing the same. Once the light had cleared, Dr. Lander still stood there, but she wasn't alone with Miss Weber anymore. Thousands of writhing black spiders began appearing and falling off her body, like a bubbling stream overflowing its banks. Dr. Lander looked down in astonishment for a fraction of a second before turning to run. The stream of the crawling predators swarmed around her. However, running up her sneakers and legs, I saw large brown recluses covering her chest and countless tiny black widows sneaking into her clothing. She began to shriek in horror and pain. Close the goddamn door, I screamed. Casey and I both started pushing on the sliding glass door as a spider swarmed towards us. A few 
cross the threshold when a rising sense of panic began to overtake me. And then with a bang, it flew gut, slicing some of the larger brown recluses in half. A small stream of a few black widows skittered towards my shoes. I began to stomping them, seeing their tiny bodies squished onto the concrete floor below. Next to me, I heard Casey breathing hard, muttering some incomprehensible prayer. I looked back to the cell and saw Dr. Lanner stumbling around, a sprinting human pillar of spiders. They swarmed in her mouth, in her ears, eyes, nose, biting, skittering, jumping all over her body. She shrieked over and over, trying to pull them out of her mouth and nose, trying to smash her body against the wall to kill them. But after a few more seconds of countless bites, her voice began to give out. She tried to walk towards the door, putting her arms out towards us, then stumbled and fell. Her arms and legs still twitched as she died on the cold floor below us. We'd better go call a code black for this, Casey said regretfully. Yeah, yeah, you're right, I said. I'm sure the guards will love this one. Casey shrugged. They're used to it, she said. The project is going to need a lot of work, I said, turning to face Casey. Do you still want to be part of Operation Raven after all of this? As long as you're in charge, she said, smiling. Always. Wow, y'all, that was a really crazy and long story. I hope y'all enjoyed it. I will see y'all soon. Love y'all so much. But until then, remember, it's scary out there. Please like and subscribe. Cross.